Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. When our son Arthur was four years old, I took him for a weekend with his aunt and uncle. Joe's sister lives on a lake up in Roaring Gap, which is almost in Virginia. And we figured, what could go wrong? Because they had water, they had boats, they had ducks, they had slides, it was like a kid's paradise. So we were living in Nashville, so I drove from Nashville to Roaring Gap, it's about six hours on a Friday. And I think I listened to Puff the Magic Dragon about 30 times. <laughs> I got there a little after lunch and uh, had lunch, got Arthur settled in and turned around and drove another six hours back to Nashville. And this was before Starbucks. <laughs> so Joe and I had a late dinner and we felt a kind of peace descend upon our household. <laughs> you know what's gonna happen. So, of course the phone rang, and of course it was Arthur, and of course he was crying, and amid his blubbering he managed to say, can I come home? So, 12 hours more in the car on Saturday, and he did come home. The point of this is not about my worthiness as a father. The point of this is that we all get lost. And to be human is to be homesick because we are wired to recognize that this is not our true home. We will be homesick until we're with God in the New Jerusalem. And until we get there, our whole lives are just as sequences of lost and found, lost and found, lost and found. We're always restless for home this side of heaven. So the truth is sometimes we are the ones who are in exile and sometimes we are the witnesses to those who find themselves in exile. That can be a literal exile. Think of all, all the people who are homeless on our border, waiting in Mexico, somewhere in Central America. It can be a spiritual exile, which is where we are, perhaps individually, but I think exactly where we are as a country, collectively. I start with this because when you read this parable that Jesus has, honestly, it doesn't make any sense. If you're a shepherd and you have a hundred sheep and one wanders off, you're going to just do the math. <laughs> Does it make sense to expose 99 sheep to danger in order to go fetch the one? Of course not. We have these sort of mental actuarial tables that tell us what to do and what not to do. And we just say to ourselves, it's the price of doing business. But notice how Jesus frames his story. I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. It's not about the sheep. It's not about doing the logical business right thing. It's not about pointing to any rules. It's finally about falling in love with the living God who calls us to do outrageous things in his name. Christianity is not about being right. It's not about being safe. Christianity is finally this love affair, and once you fall in love with Jesus, it means you fall in love with everyone. Everyone. People who don't recycle. <laughs> people who vote for the wrong people. 
people who cheer for the wrong sports teams. We are called to be fools for Christ. Now, you know the poets always say it best. They have a monopoly on all the good words. So this is a piece of Marge Percy's poem. This is what she says. Learning to love differently is hard. Love with the hands wide open. Love with the doors banging against their hinges, the cupboard unlocked. When Jesus talks about repentance, he's talking about learning to love differently. Because repentance is not about being punished for your sins. The theologian Marcus Borg defines repentance as going beyond the mind you have. Repentance is about increasing your awareness. It's about having a bigger picture of things. It's about seeing the world new. It's about throwing away your old balance sheet. It's about stopping to think what is rational or what's appropriate and to glimpse the world as God glimpses the world. To be led by your hearts and not your head. And honestly, that's why we wear these crosses around our neck. It's to remind ourselves of who we're called to follow. And following Jesus means we always reach out when someone is lost. We always reach out for our brothers and sisters, and we always thank God that someone will reach out for us. And so the Christian posture, which Judith will do in a little while, the Christian posture for prayer is always this. It's always this. We accept all of it. We open our arms to all of it. We know that God is in all of it. Inconvenient travel, men and women without documents, neighbors who vote for the wrong party, people who don't recycle, people who have incredibly powerful rifles. People, this is a little dig at my wife, but she's not here. People who would rather watch Property Brothers than read a book. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands about that. <laughs> I used to think that the goal in life was to get to a place where I was surrounded by people who thought like I do, who think like I do, who act like I do. Because we have so much in common, we have so much to talk about, and life would be so much calmer. And so my version of this parable goes something like this. Once upon a time, there were 99 sheep who all watched PBS. <laughs> and there was one sheep who wanted to watch Property Brothers. <laughs> and so the Property Brothers wandered off to watch his own channel. But when the 99 started to rejoice because the weird sheep was gone, the shepherd came and brought the weird sheep back and says, there is more joy in bringing this one back than with you good sheep who stayed in the pen so you could watch PBS. <laughs> we have to learn to love one another. And love is not a feeling. Love is an action. It doesn't matter if we agree on channels. Because the Good Shepherd says, you're together, you're always together. If you want to be near me, you're going to be near one another. So here's the real issue. Sometimes we're in the pen wondering what happened to that strange sheep. And sometimes we are the strange sheep who has wandered off. Because that dynamic is just what it means to be alive. And once we realize that the only faithful response for this is to remember once we were lost and now we are found because God loves us beyond any reason. It's why we confess our sins in church. We think, somehow we, we wonder, God, do you know about my sins? But it's not because of that, it's because we forget them. And when we forget that, we forget how gracious God is to love people like us. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. 
I once was blind and now I see. But what is it that we see? We see ourselves. We see ourselves for who we are. And once we do that, how can we not reach out to our brothers and sisters? The shepherd looks at the sheep in the fold and he glimpses the one that has wandered off. And of course he goes to the lost one because really it's not about the lost sheep. It's not about the sheep in the pen. It's all about the shepherd. It's always about the shepherd because from the shepherd, we learn learning to love differently is hard because we love with the hands wide open. Here's where it gets a little harder. I'm about to go from the sweet feel good sermon into the messing with you change your life sermon. <laughs> and when I first wrote this, I had this really sweet ending because I got to use a Sandra Bullock film. Who wouldn't want to do that? So I had an excuse to watch the film again yesterday. But then this story Jesus told just got into me and messed with me. And I realized, you know, it's not that hard to sort of empathize with going to get your son or your daughter, right? But what if the sheep who left is Donald Trump? What if the sheep who left is Nancy Pelosi? What if you as a sheep herder are really saying to yourself, thank you, Jesus, my life just got easier without that irritating sheep. Because here's the thing, when Jesus is talking about the flock, he isn't talking about the holy, righteous, properly Episcopalian flock. He's talking about the sheep that we just as soon not have. He's talking about the sheep who are a pain to us. He's talking about the sheep we avoid in our properly Episcopal way. And if we are to follow the Lord, then the way it works is sometimes you're sent to bring out the one sheep who drives you crazy back into the flock, even though you don't want to, even though it's not good sheep herding policy, because the Lord has commanded you and a little more to the point because someone did that for you. I believe this is our moment as the church because we are in the communion business. That's what we're here for. And the way God works, I think, is the way to communion is first of all, to remember what God has done for us. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Because once we do that, then we remember it's all grace. It's all grace, it's all grace. And we have the heart, we have the compassion to go out to our brothers and sisters who we think are lost because we have been lost. I thought about my son as I was picking him up. And of course, I remember the times when my parents had picked me up. I remember the time from high school when my father had to drive down to the Asheville City Jail at three in the morning to pick me up. And I remembered what it's like. I remembered what it's like to be separate from home and to wonder, will anyone come for me? We remember how often we have lost our way. And we remember the reason we are here is not because of our righteousness. It's because of God's compassion. No one wants to be estranged. No one wants to be separate from the flock. 
It's just we forget who we are. It's just we forget who God is. It's just we forget what we're called to do to eat the bread of heaven this side of heaven. And therefore, once we feel that grace inside us to go into the world and to proclaim that grace, not so much with our words, but in our deeds. So my brothers and sisters, let us remember our own limitations, our own lostness, and let us remember the times that someone reached out to us. And then let us recommit ourselves to follow the example of the Good Shepherd and to remind anyone, anyone who has wandered off to come home. Amen.